Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to our next live session, our second session this uh, uh, month in the new year of Avid Online. And for those who are joining us for the first time, a special welcome to you. Please refer to the chat box for more information about Avid Learning, the work that we do, and we hope you keep tuning in throughout the year. As our patrons already know, we use the extraordinary circumstances of 2020 that and innovated and transitioned our programming online seamlessly and inventively. Our digital further learning campaign, Avid Online, began in April 2020 and in the nine months completed over 150 programs. This year, we are committed to continue to support the arts, maintain our connections with the creative communities and facilitate learning and continuous dialogue with our audiences. So whether we continue our online sessions, transition to physical events, or have a hybrid mix of both, we stay true to our mantra, as always, that learning never stops. And this brings me to our evening session, Avid Learning Presents, Art in the COVID-19 Age, a live session with curator, poet, and cultural theorist, Ranjit Hoskote. For more about our very distinguished speaker, please refer to the chat section for his bio that should have also been emailed to you earlier. This will be our first online session with Ranjit, who has been a longtime friend and a regular collaborator of AVID. In fact, we've completed three hugely successful iterations of a series led by Ranjit called Beyond Contemporary Art, um, or BC as we like to call it. And we, we feel that with that series was a discussion that examined art making in today's world, examined trends in academia, explored the trajectory of contemporary art at large. In this session, which seems to be a fitting follow-up to BCA, Ranjit will examine how the discipline and the concept of art, as well as artistic practices, art making, engagement and consumption, has evolved during this unprecedented time of the new normal. He will probe topics such as digital art making, engagement, the uplifting power of the arts in response to the pandemic, and the collaborative and multidisciplinary character of art today. In this context of collaboration, he will touch on upon the conceptual and artisanal processes of co-production and connection. Please note this session will last 75 minutes, followed by a 15 minute Q&A in which Ranjit will be taking questions. So please keep them submitted and keep pasting them in the Q&A box. On that note, thank you once again for tuning in. Over to you, Ranjit, and look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asad. It is, as always, a great pleasure to be back uh, on the AVID platform. And I want to thank you and your marvelous colleagues at uh, AVID for this journey that we've made together uh, and uh, the ways in which you've amplified uh, knowledge in various directions, uh, working from Bombay, but now uh, really nationally and on a global scale. So it's a great uh, privilege to have uh, been your fellow pilgrim on this journey. So what I want to do today, as we address uh, this question of art in the covid scene age, and I'm now going to get around to sharing my screen. I, I thought I'd begin by uh, going back to last week, which was uh, uh, the week in which we had the Mumbai Gallery weekend. And uh, Although I didn't actually go in during the weekend, I followed it uh, in the spirit of these times uh, uh, via Instagram. And I was amazed to see just how many people came out, uh, formed themselves into groups despite our, uh, our present emergency and uh, simply wanted to make contact with art, with artistic practice, with artworks and uh, to recapture what it means to be a community. So I, when I went in a couple of days later and spoke with gallerists, with artists, with uh, auction house professionals, with fellow viewers, this is predominantly what everybody said, that after months of online viewing rooms, months of online activity, which have been remarkably useful, we ourselves are an online community right now, uh, but without in any way meaning to dismiss the sense of Con continuity and community that uh, the online space has given us, there was 
that sense of a deficit which people really wanted to overcome. How to make contact again with the artwork, with its presence, uh, with what it means to follow an artist's work through the, from the studio through to a more public showing. And what does it mean to be talking to other people and meeting them in actual life and having a conversation uh, in the presence of artworks. So this really dramatized for me again, the hits and misses, the, the deficits and the advantages of the experience we've gone through. So what I thought I'd do today is to focus on a couple or several uh, conceptual concerns and to do that whilst never letting artistic practice out of sight. So I have a subtitle for, for, for my presentation today, which is continuity, rupture, and the reinvention of practices. By which I mean really that however cataclysmic a rupture might be, it may be a war, it may be a famine, it may be a pandemic, it may be any other kind of em emergency that affects people at large, uh, societies, states, nations. But what does that really do for artistic practice? In what way do artists respond? What is at the core of my, my uh, inquiry, if you will, today is the way in which the artistic imagination responds to these existential conditions uh, by continuing with concerns, formats, media that are already in train whilst reaching out to explore new ones. That's for artists. Then there's the question of uh, how do we show artworks? So galleries and museums and other institutions have had to evolve a number of uh, solutions. And I'll talk a bit about that too as we go along. And then there is, um, there's ourselves, viewers. How do we reinvent our practices? And sometimes that leads us to paradox. And I'll unpack that as we go along. Because I think two of the key issues here are presence and detail. Uh, sometimes an online encounter seems to bring you far more into the presence and the detailed presence of an artwork than you would even uh, if you actually saw it in real life. On the other hand, you're seeing it bathed in light on a screen like this one. Uh, you're seeing it flat. What happens to the detail that is in texture, that is in resonance, uh, that is in the kinds of accidents of light and shadow that take place when you actually encounter an artwork. I think there are two, if not more views about how this plays out. So these are some of the things that I want to look at as we go along. I also want us to think together about the effect of a certain kind of shocking newness. It's been a very long time since the planet has had a pandemic, literally a hundred years, I think, since the Spanish flu that swept the planet uh, right after in the, in the closing months of uh, the First World War and then on for a while. Uh, so that was our last experience and hardly anyone alive remembers it. So we're afflicted by this tremendous sense of stasis, anxiety, uncertainty, turbulence. And one of the reactions that we in the art world tend to have to this is to ask ourselves, uh, oh, well, what media are we now going to use? What, uh, what media might artists use now? And as I've been looking at art, artworks through this period, talking to artists, sometimes making online uh, studio visits, I've actually been fascinated by how many artists have revisited the media that they've always worked with or deepened their focus allowed this experience actually to deepen very, very key pivotal experiences of being, of time, of space. What does it mean to experience duration? Uh, what does it mean to experience light? What is touch? So some of these questions uh, continue irrespective of experiments in, or with media. So I want to talk about this as well when we get to that point. So essentially there are gonna be three parts to this presentation. The first one is called, have we been here before? Which is a, sort of a flashback to previous occasions when as a species, we've, as a planet, we've engaged with this kind of uh, uh, challenge. The second part will be called, uh, here we are now. That's when I look at the practices of 10 artists who've worked through this period. And uh, finally, I'll close with a section called uh, What Do We Miss? 
So let me begin with, have we been here before? This is by way also of thinking through what to me as someone preoccupied with cultural history seems like a very important category, which is the long durée. So even if we look at the pandemic today, we should remember that although it is an event, it's part of a much larger process. And within this historical moment are folded many ongoing uh, processes or phenomena or ongoing struggles and crises. This is a great crisis. But we've also been facing other crises, particularly here in India, we've had uh, a question, a great crisis of uh, what our democracy is to mean. What does it mean to participate? Can one participate? Is one being prevented from participating? These are key questions. So alongside the public health question is also the question of institutions and of democracy. There's also the key question of, uh, of the divides that this kind of situation can produce and is producing. The, once again, I'm painfully aware that I'm uh, a beneficiary of this digital uh, world that we're all partaking of. But what has happened through this last year is the production of a new digital divide that separates the digital haves from the digital have-nots. And that inevitably is an asymmetry that gets entrenched over those asymmetries that we already have of class, of caste, of gender, of ethnicity and religion. So this is another great danger and this is something that we are going to now live with for the next few generations. Uh, to offer a very, very concrete example, children who cannot have access to continuous electricity, to a smartphone, a laptop will and are being left behind. And how are we going to deal with that question? And this ripples out to embrace many other questions. Uh, what happens to the girl child? What happens to the girl child from a, a caste that has historically suffered vulnerability? So these are the questions that surround whatever it is that we're doing today. So even as we're looking at these images, let's remember that these larger questions of community, of solidarity uh, are part of this narrative. So I want to pull us back to a, a place and time seemingly far away from us. Uh, what you see here is, is this incredible triptych by Hieronymus Bosch, uh, who has often been thought of as a proto-surrealist. But as we know, his imagination was also richly nourished by his own religious beliefs, his theological preoccupations, the kind of imagination that could imagine here, on the one hand, the Garden of Eden as a synoptic narrative, uh, the temptation, the creation of Eve, the temptation and the expulsion all happening together in a relatively idyllic and pastoral sort of uh, evocation of paradise. Over on the other side is inferno and the last judgment really is a testament to the kinds of horrors that unfolded in Bosch's own lifetime in the 15th century. Whether it was the plague that swept Europe, the cycles of warfare, the massacres, the political unrest, all of that is part of this evolving set of visions of apocalypse that you see in, in Bosch's work. And this continues to resonate for us today, perhaps with one key absence. We're not sure that even if we are part of the party of good, that we'll be redeemed or saved or receive salvation, which is, of course, at the top of the centerpiece of the triptych of the three panels. I'd next stop by at Peter Bruegel, the elders, uh, uh, great painting, the triumph of death from the middle of the 17th century. It's at the Prado, as you see. Now here again, if you look at the detail, now we know Bruegel also as someone with a wry wit, with much humor, and with the capacity for mixing the details of the everyday with all kinds of high-spirited references to folklore, to proverbs, and essentially to a world that's gone upside down. Now this world has gone upside down, but there's precious little humor. There's an army of skeletons that threatens uh, an already beleaguered community. There is at the back of the painting, it's clearly a, a seaside town, but the harbor is, is vibrant, not with ships coming in, bearing the fruits of trade, but with blazing shipwrecks, the hulks of ships. Um, people are being hanged. There is a skeleton death himself, a skeleton bearing a scythe on this exceedingly underfed horse phantom. People are being 
slaughtered on all hands. And uh, you see the ride of death with this great harvest of skulls here. Now, and here is the cross of Calvary, which should have offered some sense of consolation, but it is itself left desolate and isolated in the midst of all of this chaos that is unfolding. Once again, uh, Bruegel lived through, through the Black Death, through the plague. So what you see here is something that continues to exercise us today, perhaps not in this kind of graphic detail because our imaginations tend to flatten up with televisual uh, forms of reality. But when you look at a painting like this, you're reminded of just how powerfully the artistic imagination has been moved by the morbid, by the sense of the desolate, by the apocalypse, and by the fear of extinction. This first, uh, uh, first round of images and commentary is really uh, quite depressing. So I do apologize for that, but we'll get to another place shortly. Uh, I'm now leaping across uh, centuries and uh, landing in Central Europe in 1918. Many of us know Gustav Klimt, of course, as this uh, um, marvelously vibrant, very sensuous, erotically charged uh, uh, painter of erotically charged paintings uh, associated with the Vienna Secession. Uh, but he, was a, he fell victim to the Spanish flu that really spread across the world uh, through, through across 1918 and Moritz Schrott, the sculptor, made a death mask of Klimt. So I thought I would represent Klimt in our conversation here, not through his scintillating and shimmering uh, uh, draperies in which he, cla in which he clad his, his female protagonists, but through this, the sense of an ending, uh, his ending and the ending of millions of people across the world, including here, not only in Europe, and alongside that, later in that same year, uh, Egon Schiele. Uh, Egon Schiele lost a child early in the year, and later his wife died in October. And there's a set of incredibly moving drawings that he made of her last days and hours. And within three days of making this drawing, Schiele himself died of the Spanish flu. So again, also something that reminds us of how an image like this, uh, retains its perennial charge, it retains even a certain kind of uh, tragic beauty, and it comes to us from a context uh, of, um, of loss, like the one it, it emerges from. And Munch, who many of us associate, of course, with the scream, which has simply become part of popular culture, uh, Munch lived on for a very, very long time. I myself was a bit startled when I realized that when I went to the Munch Museum in Oslo, because you tend to think of his great work of the late 19th century and then you sort of forget about him. But he went on, survived the Spanish flu and continued uh, well into the early 40s, as I remember. So a long lived artist. And this is a portrait, which I, a self portrait where He's really presenting himself, remember all his early work, the unstable, fluctuating expressionist brushwork, the acid and neon colors. And here suddenly you have an image of the artist as uh, an aging, ailing person, someone who's uh, swaddled up, hoping for the best, dealing with affliction and placed within an interiority. Now, normally the studio for artists and for writers is a space of, uh, of security. It's a happy space. It's where you work. It's where you think your thoughts, make your images, where you're at peace. But imagine a time in quarantine and isolation as we've all done, where the, the, the interior of the studio can assume quite other, uh, uh, other associations. And here you see how the studio or the home can also be a prison in the way in which Munch evokes it. And I'm going to include the Bengal famine in this list of pandemics because it did actually, if you would just go back to the, the etymology of, of pandemic, pandemos, something that affects all people. I would include the Bengal famine because it actually affected millions of people in 1943. And it also had the additional tragic distinction of having been largely a human made catastrophe. 
I mean, when people think of a famine, they assume that it happened because the harvests failed, the crop cycles didn't come through, or there was uh, a water deficit. But actually, uh, the harvest had been pretty good. But every spare and not so spare piece of uh, food, of uh, supplies was taken off to the war effort of the allies, leaving the people in a number of districts in Bengal, beginning with Midnapur, uh, without access to food. And uh, men, women, and children died in vast numbers. It was another one of the final scandals of the British Empire in India, which added to its decline and fall. And uh, as many of you know, a number of artists uh, affiliated with the left formation went out and documented this. Uh, Jitta Prashad, through his incredible ink drawings and the prints and the book he made, Hungry Bengal, uh, Sunil Jana through his photographs and Shomnath Hor through his drawings, later his prints, later his uh, mixed media paper sculpture works. So I thought I'd at this point also have Chitta Prashad as someone who bore witness to, to what a pandemic can do, what it does to people. And when I look at an image like this, I think also of those who were exceedingly vulnerable last year. Uh, who were part of the floating population of the metropolis, of, of the metropolitan India, and who were left without safeguards and protections and were just essentially ejected from the system of capital and labor and uh, left to make their own way home, as we all know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles to their villages. Uh, many of them did not survive. Those who survived found themselves not very welcome when they got back. So the great question then also was, where is home? Where do we belong? What is it that assures one of security? So these are the sorts of key existential questions that would preoccupy the artistic imagination alongside the question of how do I survive? What sense do I make of the studio? Uh, how do I reestablish a connection with those from whom I've been isolated? So there is at once for any artist, any creative imagination, the question of how to secure oneself as a creative agent and how also to establish forms of solidarity. So I'm going to move from there now to this second uh, movement, if you will, of this evening. And uh, I'm going to dwell here on, uh, as I've said, views from the studio beyond the individual. I want to be able to think through, as I discuss the works of these 10 artists that I have, uh, questions of how isolation can be at first a deeply disconcerting experience, but yet can be uh, productive, can be made productive. What are the fruits of quarantine, for instance? I also want to think about how, for many, many artists, uh, the reality of everyday work is the reality of discipline. Uh, very few of us now, particularly in this group, are sold on notions of inspiration as falling from heaven. None of us really believe that. But we do know that there is, for every artist, a certain need to go back to what you're working on, to explore that, to listen, as the Gutai artist said, to the cry of the material, or to set up working constraints within which the image or the poem or the film or the theater piece, whatever it is, emerges and pushes up against. I'd also like to explore the notion of time, the experience of time, as it came across to a number of these artists and others who I don't have on my list here. This, remember, is an indicative list. How was time experienced? Its speed, its slowing down, notions of duration. How did one or how did many artists experience time as something that happens within the body in terms of bodily cycles, cellularity, the experience of diurnal and nocturnal cycles, and how did that connect in some way with the larger cycles of the planet and the cosmos? How did memory resurface through these days and weeks and months of essentially being by yourself without friends, communicating only uh, remotely? What memories surfaced? What repose was there to think about things one had not had the time to think about? How did one archive oneself? whether it was through an actual archive, bringing things together that one hadn't had the time to put together, or through the building up of what one had loved, what had become part of muscle memory, 
what is part of the incredible inner library of images that many, many artists carry with them. And uh, also I would explore with some artists <clears throat> the possibility that through their work with the, the visual image, they also established a connection with larger questions, larger forms of unrest, which had exploded in any case <clears throat> in 2019, in 2018, and which came to a head a couple of months before the pandemic and the lockdown. So whilst the pandemic and the lockdown were indeed extremely salient, these other forms of unrest continued to exercise the ethical sensibility and the artistic imagination. So I'm going to begin now with the work of Sudhir Patwardhan. Many of you, of course, uh, visited or had some uh, uh, some encounter or acquaintance with the large scale retrospective of Sudhir Patwardhan's work that took place over late 2019, early 2020, curated by Nancy Arjania. And uh, it strikes me that uh, Patwardhan found himself, as he himself says, in a rather strange place in the middle of the lockdown. For weeks and months prior, he and um, his wife, the dancer and dance scholar Shanta Patwardhan, had come pretty much every day to the National Gallery of Modern Art, Pompeii. Uh, this is part of a time-honored uh, tradition for a certain generation of artists. When your show opens, particularly if it's at the Jahangir Art Gallery, uh, you're there every day. Because after the self-isolation of the studio, this is where you meet your viewers, this is where you meet um, collectors, critics, uh, people at large. This is, this, is, this is how the process of art making gets completed uh, in the presence of the viewer. That got cut away. Suddenly from that space of much sociality and much being with others, there was a pulling back. So in a series of paintings that Sudhir made during this period, whether it was an acrylic on canvas or in pastel, as I'll show, or a mix of acrylic and oil, uh, there's an exploration of the interior space, which takes forward his uh, most recent uh, uh, direction in any case, but it's veined over with a sense of, of anxiety, of um, uh, captivity even, if you will. That was lockdown couple. This is morning tea with a certain sense of an ex almost a kind of, there's often an expressionist invocation in Sudhir's work of threat, the threat from the outside, or sometimes a phantom threat that is already inside and which articulates itself. And I can't help but think that this strange fan up here is a kind of homage maybe to one of Bhupen Kakar's paintings. We should, I should ask Sudhir about this really. So, in a, so when I look at a painting like this, a straight detail like this reminds me that this is a domestic interior, but it does have some correspondence and dialogue with uh, Bhupen Kakar's series of uh, paintings which were devoted to occupations, Janta Watch Repair, for instance, and so on. Many of you will know these works. So what is happening here, whilst facing an ex existential and experiential rupture, there is yet a continuity with dialogues with fellow artists, with images, with historical moments in which the artist has participated. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, rather keen that we should, we should bear all this in mind when we look at these images that came out, these works that came out of, uh, of, uh, of what we went through together last year. Once again, um, Sudhir drawing on his own training and uh, many decades of work in the medical profession, the medical field, but drawing also on a lifetime of working not only with painting, but very much in the graphic mode, with graphite, with charcoal, with pastel. So in a work like this, he evokes the kinds of inexplicable spectral figures that shadow our everyday lives. Also reminds us forcefully of what this public health emergency meant at, in the textures of the intimate to the individual who was faced with a contagion that was an invisible enemy, who was then pretty much handed over if by great misfortune, someone did actually suffer from COVID, many, many people did and continue to do, then you were handed over to uh, a system without sympathy, a machine, staffed by people who also had been placed under unbelievable duress and uh, 
to breaking point. So a work like this could be set in peacetime, so to speak. But when we see it through the lens of the, what I've called the COVID scene here, we're reminded of all these other forms of alienation, of uh, institutional deficit, of what it means at the individual and the interpersonal level. What are the costs that have been exacted? And how do we face them together? What are the forms of compassion and empathy and policy by which we can overcome these, these challenges and uh, these, uh, these traumas that we've all suffered together, but especially those who have been at the front lines of, of the public health challenge. An intergenerational moment of dissonance, which occasionally Sudhir has dwelt on, uh, and a sense of how the, the, the space of interiority, the domestic space, can also be a space of conflict and how is this, how is this evoked, how is it to be managed, what is it that happens. When I looked at this painting, for instance, I found myself thinking of uh, well beyond what the painter might have had in mind or not. I also found myself thinking, as many, many activists, for instance, have been thinking of uh, what is it? What is what does this kind of quarantine mean when you say you have to work from home or people have to be confined to their homes? For many people, getting out of their homes is a form of salvation because of what we know is a widespread and deeply deplorable malaise, uh, violence within the home space. And again, in no way do I wish to reduce a painting like this with its many meanings to uh, uh, sort of to an illustration of, of uh, a social uh, failing, a social problem, uh, uh, a malaise that afflicts us. But we are the same people who are looking at art today. We are the same people who are reflecting on what everything that's gone wrong in our society and our polity. And it actually, I think, enlarges the scope of how we approach an image when we address it both through our, if you will, aesthetic consciousness and through all those parts of us that have to do with the ethical and the civic. There's, there's, we're also looking at these paintings as citizens. So what does that involve? And from those rather grimmer questions, um, I come to Sudhir's music lesson, which for me reminds me of this question of what I spoke about earlier, uh, the axis of discipline in the work of art. What does it mean to go back to your score, go back to your instrument and engage with it, engage with what the tradition that's gone before and yet establish a space of innovation. Uh, and it's also a beautiful evocation of childhood. I often think that it's a strand in Sudhir's work that, that speaks to all of us. There is, of course, there are, there are the portraits of aging, but there are also the portraits of children, of um, cells that are at the beginning of the journey of life. And uh, this is one of those paintings which suddenly suggests that in the middle of everything that's collapsing, there's also this uh, wager on, on, uh, on continuity of what, of what survives and endures and comes after. I'm going to move now from Sudhir's so explorations of interiority and uh, time and the key questions to a very particular body of work that many of you will know already from indeed an online viewing room. Uh, Jitish Kalat's circadian study, contact tracing, a series of, um, I would say, graphic works, because they really bring into play a variety of, um, of graphic modes. And as many of you know, they were made at a time when the artist returned from a journey overseas and found himself having to, it was early in the lockdown in March last year. So he quarantined himself in his studio and there spent close to two weeks, 12 days, as I recall. Uh, and I had a wonderful conversation with him recently about this work. And uh, there applied himself to the quotidian tasks, uh, exploring what it means to, to be alone, to water the plants, to look at and experience the sunlight, and to continue with the daily practice of art. And all of these things came together in, in this series, in, uh, not quite fortuitous way because Kalat's work has for a long time been premised on the exploration of time, duration, temporality at a variety of scales. Uh, from the scale of the in-breath and the out-breath 
to day and night, to the centuries, to questions of planetary orbit and the turning of the galaxies and the nebulae. And all of these very large questions came together in the intimate space of these drawings, these tracings even. At some point whilst he was watering his plants on the terrace, Kala tells us, he began to simply trace the shadows of twigs that had fallen. And as he continued to do this, he began to see that in some way, this very uh, microcosmic intimate practice actually mirrored the, the transit of the sun. And in a way, the twig that blocked the light and threw a shadow was the equivalent, if you will, of the planet itself. And that what was on the paper was the dark side. It's the side of the earth that is not touched by the sun yet. And uh, as he began to use the materials that were at his disposal at that point, as you see, uh, pencil, uh, aquarel uh, paint, aquarel pencils, uh, red and green, stained gesso and gum, uh, this opened up at another symbolic level for him. The red and the green, as they traced the movement of the shadow, also formed a certain sort of dialogue between hemoglobin and chlorophyll. What does it mean to share space across species, to be a human and a plant sharing the same space, the same resources, and to be launched on different sorts of bodily processes? And what is the kind of, can one predict the sort of temporality that each lives in? Might there even be communication? And when we look at works like these, uh, and each of these works also brought forth from the artist, uh, occasional annotations, uh, drawings of precisely what I've been talking about it, astronomical movements. And small as these are and beautiful and intimate as they are, they take us into this larger space of dilemma and crisis and possible redemption, even if it's at this very, very uh, small level of uh, an individual and a plant. Uh, what does that say? for the larger questions of ecocide of which we are guilty as a species, uh, an ecocide that will eventually end with the extinction of our own species. And I would relate this to a number of other works in which Kalath invokes, for instance, the time it takes to control your breath, to breathe out, breathe in, uh, all of the many works where he uses the figure of the, the image of the chapati to invoke the phases of the moon. And um, to, to see how one sets this kind of investigation alongside that of Sudhir Patwardhan, which explores an idiom of figuration to which Sudhir has long been committed. And I would take these thoughts with me now, these thoughts about Jyotish's circadian studies to the work of, a, of an emerging artist called Manjot Kaur, Plants of the New Children. Uh, we've heard from her before in an AVID context because AVID in collaboration with INLAX held a collaborative a virtual residency uh, a few months ago, which was an experimental response to this situation. How might a certain number of young artists come together and work in virtual space, through conversation, through dialogue, through the sharing of resources and ideas, and then go off and produce their own work. Meanwhile, the situation was complicated for Manjot Kaur because she found herself transiting among continents between India, Canada, and the Netherlands. And she's in fact in Maastricht on a residency right now. So for, an, for her specifically, uh, this situation of pandemic was also a situation of displacement, of being away from loved ones, of exploring a new context. And artists' residencies are normally, as many of us who've been on residencies know, they're actually oases. They're very happy spaces and you're cut away from all the normal constraints and demands and you can focus on getting, your, getting on with, uh, with the work you really want to do. But what does it mean to have a residency at this kind of time when you're not even sure whether you might be locked out, whether you can travel, when your mobility has been curtailed? To me, mobile at a time of curtailed mobility. It's a strange sort of moment. So Manjot Kaur tells us that, she, that her thoughts turned to this question of how to think about the generations to come. 
or to think about this in a transhuman and interspecies way. So this body of work called Plants of the New Children, which is accompanied by a long, by a text of which I only have the first line here. Can I show a landscape as the protagonist in which humans are only one kind of participant? And I'd like to think about Manjot Kaur's work as a take on two kinds of, at least two kinds of genres. This is again, something that deeply interests me. How do moments like the pandemic or like war throw artists back on an economy of means on the one hand, as we, for instance, saw with Jitish or with Sudhir, yet also throws artists back on the resources of the tradition, the genealogy, the discipline that they inherit and work in. So when I look at Manjot Kaur's works, I ask myself, uh, in what way do they extend the notion of the landscape? The landscape genre is one that has been with us for a very long time. Remember that the landscape is effectively an invention. There are no landscapes in nature. Uh, to create a landscape, it's necessary to have the sovereign gazing eye of the viewer. What these works do is really to question that sovereignty of the gazing eye and to think about landscape as we saw here as uh, as a participant in acts of representing landscape, acts of representing nature, plants, uh, and that it has a voice as well. It's, it's a, I would have said a marvelously pantheistic, but this is not really a pantheistic approach. It's a way of expanding the voices of representation to non-human agents. And it's also a way of opening up the landscape through text and image, diagram, annotation, thinking through what processes of generation and regeneration might mean at the human level, but also at the level of the planet, at the level of uh, plants. And there is again, a diversity of means that comes into play here. So this again, excites me as a view from the studio. How might one in what has now become the captivity of the studio yet work in ways that address much larger questions, which then get held in reserve for a larger conversation. Okay. It also, I, I began to say that uh, these works address several uh, legacies uh, of, the, of the discipline. So if they deal in one way with the legacy of the landscape, they also ask us and invite us to think about the limits, the possibilities, and the new potentials of abstraction. As someone profoundly concerned with abstraction, I also like to think about how abstraction itself could be uh, political in its edge. Abstraction is sometimes mistakenly thought to be an escape from politics and from uh, collective experience, but sometimes, as here, might it not become part of a story about uh, a new political expression? a new environmental sense of uh, participation and representation. I move now to Atul Dodia. As again, I keep invoking the, the great medium of the day, but those of you who are in, in, on Instagram uh, would know that Atul has often posted almost every day uh, works, watercolors that he's been making on, 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 on really on a daily basis. Once again, it's, it started because he couldn't go to his studio. So he had to work with what he had at home. And this became his riyaz, this became a sadhana, this became, as it is for the musician, it became his everyday practice of, of art. And this is where, when I look at these works, I find a Dodia returning to things that have preoccupied him for a very long time indeed. His viewing, he is one of these artists who has literally thousands of artworks stocked in the archive of his mind. And here we find him turning to works from the Trecento, works by the Italian masters of the Renaissance. Sometimes he returns to, to the Rajput and the Jain uh, illuminated manuscripts. In each case, he seems to focus on moments of paradox, of uh, uncertainty and of miracle. When I look at this work, for instance, I'm quite convinced that it has its origins in a Trecento painting somewhere. And what does it say to us? It speaks of a figure in retreat, in a form of isolation. Again, many of these figures are monks or pilgrims. Again, I tend to think that this, we see here the artist reflecting on other forms 
and experiences of isolation, which are productive. What does it mean to be a monk in a cell, in an abbey, in a cave? What does it mean to be a pilgrim on a remote track or on his way to a, or her way to a shrine? I find also these evocations of, uh, of the boat, of thwarted mobility, of uh, livelihood that might be endangered. And yet again, in many works, like many of these watercolors that I've been diligently following as Atul puts them out, I find him returning again and again to what for me certainly comes across as the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus, the apostles, uh, the miracles, and the presence of, of Galilee is not far away. And it maps in a certain way on what I assume Atul ha couldn't experience in his isolation, which is the sea. Imagine being an artist isolated in an island city and unable to, to have a direct experience of the sea. Once again, here you see a process by which the artist is returning to uh, figures that have popped up numerous times before in his repertoire, in a work, in a body of work called Pale Ancestors, for instance, um, and in many others. So again, there is, there is here uh, a, a refinement of vocabulary, a process of preparation that inaugurates possibly a new style of work, a new language even. And I've been fascinated by this hollow in the tree, which sometimes might be a dark halo above a protagonist. And the ways in which the trees themselves seem like figures that have become petrified, human figures that have been petrified. In Dodia's work too, and I can't help feeling that this has something to do with the momentous urgencies of the time, the borders between human and mineral and plant have, uh, have been greatly blurred, particularly in these works. Once again, what is that hollow in the tree? Is, is this renunciate figure speaking to the spirit of the tree? Is he seeking a lost halo? Is that a dark mirror? Or is there some form of communication with other worlds that's happening here? I move now to Samir Kulavur's work, and this was, uh, it's, it's been shown recently at, uh, at Tark in Bombay. And when we visited, I was struck by the gear shift in this artist's work. Uh, it clearly predates the, the, the pandemic, but you'll see how it peaks uh, during the pandemic too. What I find here is whilst this body of work really has to do with the, the ubiquity of the smartphone, and the kind of artificial illumination that it simply has made part of our everyday lives. Uh, the collectives that he invokes are in some form of dialogue with Sudhir Patwardhan's work that I showed, not in that work, but with Sudhir Patwardhan's work. And um, it has to do with how the crowd is to be imagined. It has to do with the motivations of the crowd. Uh, and if in Sudhir Patwardhan's works of the 70s and 80s, the crowd was actually a mobilization of people, individuals brought together by an ideology of emancipation, the crowds in Kulavur are united by their very peculiar vicariousness. They're all physically present together, but what unites them is their remote and vicarious desire to record and share something through their communication devices. And when I look at this work, it reminds me also, and clearly is, it is based on newspaper photographs that have to do with the tragic, tragic uh, non-participation of certain kinds of crowds in India. What does it mean to be a mob that has lost all sense of compassion in destroying an individual? What does it mean to be a a bystander, an onlooker, while public acts of violence are going forward. What does it mean to be, to be recording something on a cell phone whilst you should actually have tried to go out there and stop it? What are the reserves of courage, of empathy, of compassion that have been replaced by this very strange sense of wanting to be part of a vast but nameless sort of crowd? a vast and actually unconnected crowd, something that's connected by memes, if you will. 
other forms of collectives, floating, adrift, uncertain, vulnerable, appear in these works. Unemployed but free data is an ironic take on the fact that the pandemic or what preceded it, the demonetization and other kinds of human made forms of chaos left people out of the loop, out of what I characterized earlier as the mechanisms of uh, capital and labor. So here are these unemployed people. And yet they think that there's certain kind of participation because data on their phone packages is free. So how do they yet preserve some sort of sense of a larger participation in a collective, some form of communication, some assurance that they're not quite alienated? Part of a larger work, uh, which was composed from several elements, uh, multi-panel work is notification here. This is, um, and it occurs to me always late that I should have the reference image in my, in my slide sequence, but this is, um, almost precisely a homage to a Sudhir Patwardhan work of a figure leaning out on a balcony with a, a shadow of a lamppost um, falling across, across it. A lamppost in Patwardhan, an earlier kind of economy and body of, and form of technology. Here, another kind of technology, another kind of illumination. And JCB presents us with something else that the smartphone can in fact do, a more productive use, where it can convey from the front lines of oppression uh, what is going forward. So the raising of settlements, the rendering vulnerable of the, the already marginal, uh, the, the, the iron fist of the state and of uh, corporate interests, whether in mining, whether in real estate, whether in a number of situations where uh, power and vulnerability come face to face, this smartphone, which I've been deploring pretty much all this while, comes in very handy as a means of recording and reporting uh, what is actually going forward. So such a moment might well be captured here um, in, in, this, in this painting. And this brings me, now I've been discussing through these earlier works, forms of alienation and atomization as well as potentials for coming together. In a work like Read and Resist, what Kolobur does is really to, to render homage to a movement that seems to have been substantially forgotten now, but uh, which really laid a claim to community formation across all lines of division. It made a claim to occupying public space and to asserting resistance to oppression and to putting forward the voice of, uh, of reason and of equity and of justice. I'm thinking here of Shaheen Berg. And um, it's actually a multi-part part work. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, eight different parts, which are presented as a grid. And in it, you find the artist now wading right into this historical moment and using a variety of approaches. For instance, there is in what appears to be the foreground there's actually a sort of break between the deep recessive uh, vanishing point perspective almost that is invoked here in the upper panels. And in these lower panels, you have almost a kind of illustrator's approach, something that is also deeply connected to the mural tradition. And um, if you have the multitudes evoked through a certain form of abstraction where you see the power uh, and, and uh, the proliferation of the multitudes all joined together in acts of resistance. You see the other side of it here in, in uh, up close, uh, very close to us. And you see here the kinds of reinforcements in terms of education, enlightenment, access to texts that will liberate the mind uh, and to ideologies, whether those of Gandhi or those of Ambedkar that invite us really to read and resist. Ambedkar took from the American labor movement the, the great uh, slogan, um, educate, uh, organize, uh, organize, agitate, educate, and uh, our variations of these three mandates. And all of that comes powerfully into play in this painting. And um, as I look at it, I begin to think suddenly of a painter who presents, as we've seen, portraits of atomization, which have to do very much with the individual figure. 
but can also open out in this more panoramic way to speak as, uh, as Diego Rivera did uh, in, in the tonality and the address and the register of the muralist. So once again, I find myself deeply interested by the play of scale in many of the works that have emerged during 2020 from the very intimate to something that has the ambitions of the mural. And in that same sense of the play of scale, I come now to four beautiful drawings. Uh, how am I doing for time? Six, okay. Um, I come now to four drawings by Sahaj Rahal, who many of you know as an artist who has presented accomplished work across media, uh, through video works, through drawings, through sculptures, performances, and uh, in these drawings, which he calls the cloud keepers, uh, and he has stories of his own that go with these, but he always invites viewers to bring their stories. When I look at these, I'm, and he, he presents, for instance, this, they're, they're actually on show right now at Chatterjee and Lal. It's part of a marvelous exhibition that is trans-historical and trans-genre medium. Uh, the cloud keepers might be our alter egos, or they might represent the forces of nature and of history. This for Rahal represents the almost accidentally and unknowingly created human being that leaps out of the Nasadiya Sutra, the 129th hymn in the 10th book of the Rig Veda. That's the citation that he offered. And the constant refrain in that hymn, remember that many people think of the Vedas as infallible. But there's a great deal of self-doubt that's waned into the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda says at this point, Perhaps the great God, the creator knows, or perhaps he doesn't know. And it's this balance of knowledge and uncertainty that characterizes a work like this. Uh, is this a figure of incredible elemental violence or is this somehow a figure that can't even find its way around? And is this us? This figure Rahal characterizes as being more like an Ifrit, a jinn, someone who emerges from the world of Tilism and Razm and Bazm, the great story cycles of, uh, of magic and miraculous deeds in the Perso-Arabic world, um, such as the Tilis Mehoshruba, for instance. And this marvelous flame hair also reminds us of figures in Safavid painting, for instance. So is this a genie, part angel, part demon, someone who will do the bidding of humanity, or is he more like a Japanese Mio figure, a guardian, or a Dikpala, a lord of the directions, someone who oversees and sometimes intervenes in human affairs? This to Rahal is Homo sapiens, uh, scarred, shaky, uh, trapped between processes of nature's making and processes of his own making not quite Rodin's thinker, but someone else, a figure possibly of bafflement. And this to Sahaj is uh, what he wrote to me in, a, in, a, in an email. As he's, this is a sick man who is trying to repair his, or to, to, to fix back an arm that's broken. And that reminded me very, very forcefully of, uh, of a hymn of Guru Gobind Singh's uh, uh, where many of you will know it, but one of the great lines in it, it's, it's, it's a definition of the hero. And one of the lines is, Purza, Purza, Katamare. Uh, even if every limb in his body were to be cut away, he would still not uh, shy away from protecting the weak and the vulnerable. And um, as many of you will know also from <clears throat> the, the communications he makes via social media, this is an artist who has been profoundly caught up with <clears throat> the farmer's agitation. So I would see this work alongside Samir, Samir Kulavur's work on Shaheen Bagh. <clears throat> to me, this work comes down from the world of the Dikpalas and the Jinns and the Nasadiya Sutra, <clears throat> and it inhabits our present forcefully. It undertakes, figure undertaking the work of self-repair, which is also the repair of others. Someone who understands vulnerability and understands the everyday heroism of standing up to protect those who are vulnerable. So the cloud keepers do not inhabit the clouds alone. They also come down and inhabit the parched earth and the earth of borders and barriers. Once again, <clears throat> to make the point that 
uh, all the other forms of unrest that have accompanied the, uh, the, um, the pandemic continue to exercise artists and find articulation not necessarily through electronic or interactive means, but also through something as time-honored as the drawing, the very first gesture of art making, the Neolithic artist with his or her charcoal stick, still active, still wondrously imaginative and connecting us with worlds beyond ourselves. And as I come to the close of this, of this presentation, I want to dwell on a few works. Uh, Sosa Joseph's work here, which also is on view uh, uh, in an exhibition called Red at Mechandani and Steinrucker. As you see, I'm also drawing on things that I, I actually have seen because I want to convey the thrum of something personally seen and experienced uh, in this talk. I didn't really want it to be a general survey of what artists here, there and everywhere might be doing or what uh, forms they might be, might be experimenting with in the short term. As I said, when I began, I'm also preoccupied with the long term, the long durée. What does, how does that sediment itself within the event of a pandemic or any such cataclysm? Sosa's figure here, and I offer you also detail, is, uh, is very much a Pieta. And really that was through a process of conversation that some of us had with her, <clears throat> that she arrived at this characterization. The painting was originally called, Oh My Son, but it's unmistakably always was a Pieta. Although it began for her with a newspaper photograph of a woman mourning us, a woman belonging to a tribal community mourning her son. And as the painting evolved, it became also a kind of world picture. For instance, if you look around, you'll find that there's all kinds of other activity here. Uh, uh, there's figures that are threatened with precarity, figures thwarted in their crossing, <clears throat> uh, other forms of communication across or between other species, uh, figures who seem to have lost their way and are unwitting uh, witnesses. A work like this, although it is in a very different time, place, and medium, takes us back to the grand machines of narrative, such as the ones by Bruegel that we saw at the beginning of this uh, presentation. And again, for grants for us, that primal cry of the oppressed, which rings through a number of the works that we've seen here. The, figure of bare life, the figure of the, uh, of the unaccommodated self, which really is also at the heart of this pandemic. As I said, specifically with reference to those most vulnerable during the pandemic, this is what we were reminded of. And I come to the last three artists in my, in my roster today. Arun, K.S., uh, a, a number of people were quite uh, startled by his choice of medium. It's, it actually works across sculpture and painting. And some of the work, some of the, some, of the, some of the materials that have gone into that painting include the pulp of Bible paper. So in a strange way, the sacred is really worked literally into the surface of, of this battle. There's a profound sense of theater that proceeds here. Again, a work that's been rendered over this period that we've all gone through but draws on prior collecting practices that the artist has. He spends a lot of time looking for uh, pieces of wood from old 18th and 19th century houses in, in and around Baroda, where he lives and works. And these panels have taken him several years to work on. It's a meditative practice. It's built up in multiple layers. And I offer you details. On the one hand, uh, this assemblage, if you will, of different parts of uh, a fallen house held together by brass shafts and a close-up detail of, of the painting. So once again, you find in his work different kinds of temporalities of labor which are mapped in. And whilst this seems to us like a <clears throat> monumental memorial, if you will, for all those who have fallen and all those who have suffered in this period, it also has a basis in his ongoing language of developing the monument uh, in, in this kind of language of assemblage that works across well-defined media. And also the startling contrast between the sensuously rich, vibrant, and even delightful surface of the painting, which you see when you're close up, 
to it. And <clears throat> the austere, pared down, weathered feel of the key monument, which is like a shrine to an unknown or unknowable God or, an, or a vanished God, possibly an absconding, a deus absconditus. There is something here that suggests the lamp might be lit, but is this a shrine or is this what remains of a shrine? Vipeksha Gupta, whose exhibition will open at Blueprint 12 by the end of this month, when Blueprint 12 opened their new space. Uh, I've been looking at her work and I've been fascinated again by the way in which it explores notions of mindfulness. Again, whether it was in Jitish's work in one way, some years in a totally different way, this notion of returning to focus on things that have moved one deeply with a minimum of resources really plays out here. Uh, this work is informed by a preoccupation with and a practice of uh, Buddhist mindfulness. What does it mean to, at a micro level, experience one's sensations, stop and consider one's thoughts, watch the process by which ideas and emotions arise, come to be, fall away, register, leave a mark. <clears throat> and all this is rendered really through the simplest of means, graphite and charcoal and paper. And I have to say that what attracted me to this work also was the way in which it seems to speak across generations to an artist whose work I deeply love and was a dear friend, Melly Gobai. So once again, what does it mean to reinvigorate abstraction in the abstract space through very basic means? The division of space, which suggests, what does it suggest? Um, testaments, tablets, uh, a planetary surface. Uh, Nasreen too is rendered homage in, in works like this. And yet you're endlessly fascinated by how just black, white and the gray scale can absorb one into a deeply contemplative space. And that contemplative space is a pole opposite to agitation and turbulence and its importance cannot be understated. Uh, in the kinds of trauma and crisis that we've all gone through, whether at first hand or remotely, altogether really as a species. And I'll close this part of my presentation before I go on to a very brief uh, coda with again, the work of an artist whose paintings have fascinated me and whose poems and plays have also fascinated me for a very, very long time. I see him as a mentor figure, uh, Gif Patel. This is also on display right now at, uh, uh, at the exhibition called Red. Mary, my patient, where Give like Sudhir, uh, for a very long time a medical practitioner, goes back into the fact of human encounter with one of his patients, uh, presumably long bound by the contract of confidentiality between doctor and patient, perhaps he's been released from that now and is more able to register what otherwise went into, uh, for instance, a wonderful, wonderful, I say, but it was also a terrifying series called, uh, which he called the evolving family of, of humankind. Through the eighties, the head of a Yonak smashed head, crushed head, Many, many works in which the sheer physical and spiritual vulnerability of the human subject was very much at the fore. With this work, what absorbs me and fascinates me about it is the way in which it's both a living figure and perhaps a death mask, a painting, but a painting that appears to encode some relationship with what a photograph could do. And yet, even as it makes some reference to photographic visuality, it then moves well beyond that through the handling of the sculptural almost handling of, of angles and shadow and so forth to move us towards an appreciation of painting as something that can also evoke sculpture. It brings us back to the magic of the two dimensional surface that can evoke dimensionalities beyond what is physically possible to it. And of course, there's this element which could be fire, could be a bush, could be a burning bush. And uh, it's with this close encounter with our own kind that I'll close my uh, roster of images today. Uh, once again, thinking about how this kind of, what I, what I uh, in a counter to early Spielberg 
characterized as a close encounter with our own kind, that is what we were deprived of in large measure. How does a work like this remind us of the restoration of that possibility? And I'll close with this card. Yeah, what do, what do we miss? We've missed space. We continue to miss it. We miss what it means to be mobile in space, to travel, but also to reach out and connect. We've missed experiences of duration because our duration has become sedimented around our routines in our own home spaces. Communication, although constant as now, uh, is not as palpable, not as immediate as it is when you're sitting across the table from somebody. Touch, the haptic sense of an object of the other. What does it mean to feel the contour of a sculpture? Uh, this is something that we can only experience in forms of showing that are physical. We miss detail. As I said when I began, the reality of detail is extreme when we can close up on it via a device like this. But does it get us grain? Does it get us shadow? Does it get us deceptive forms of linearity? There are complexities in the work as made that really don't reveal themselves unless you're looking at the work itself. And I close with, I close with the notion of delight because it's this uh, encyclopedic possibility of seeing practically everything sitting in front of our screens that we have. But is that delight is the question. Does the flatness of online experience really allow us delight? That's the question that I'm going to end with. I'm going to leave you with. And uh, it's a question that I think preoccupies all actors in, in the art world. But if you take the primal scene to be the making, the showing, and the seeing of the artwork, you'll see how this question of delight preoccupies and colors each one of these great stages. The delight of the artist making a work, the delight of the gallerist or museum professional or institution showing it, the delight of us, our delight as, as we view it. Is that best done remotely? Uh, even if this is now contingent upon our condition? Or do we create reflexes for this time, but go forward, not back to what used to be normal, but go forward with a much, much richer appreciation of the haptic, the visceral, the physical, and the immediate. Those are the thoughts I'll leave you with for now. Thank you so much. You've been an incredibly patient and kind audience. Uh, thank you, Ranjit. Uh, we have many questions. Would you attempt to cover a few of them? We have about sure. uh, 15 minutes left. So, yeah. Okay, Can fantastic. Yes. Shall I pick them off the Q&A? There are 17. Good heavens. Where shall I begin? Neha Solanki asks, the pandemic has made us question several concepts. Would you consider memory as a social con? construct, especially with respect to Sudhir Patwardhan's paintings. Indeed, memory is a social construct. I think there is, of course, the individual memory that each one of us has. I mean, naturally, that's, that pertains to ourselves. But the, the fabric of memory is a collective production. If you take our historical or archival memory, that's a collective production. If you take everything we've uh, committed to to reflex, to knowledge, to conditioning. Much of that comes from outside of us and is shared with others. So definitely memory is to, certainly has a powerful dimension of, of, uh, of being a social construct. But what I've been trying to say and show through these, through these particular practices and works is also how precisely there's been a divergence and a convergence again between individual and collective memory. In the isolation of the studio, in quarantine or in self-isolation, how does the artist explore his or her own memory bank, her or his own preferences, preoccupations, the inner archive, and connect that with what is shared uh, with the community? And sometimes forms of memory also become forms of agency and action and desire, as they do when you express solidarity. Gaurav Ogle's question is, art previews have been happening at commercial galleries, but will we return to large-scale exhibitions, biennials, art festivals, et cetera, right away and on the same scale? Clearly not. Until, until the vaccine is reasonably widespread, until it's seen to be uh, 
efficacious until we have some better sense of how to negotiate this post. I mean, will there even be a post pandemic time? I'm not sure. So until we've developed a whole series of planet-wide responses to this and travel really becomes viable, possible again, I don't think we're going to have a return to, to actual biennials and art festivals, transcontinental uh, platforms particularly, I think, um, but people will be cautious about. Uh, Large-scale exhibitions, biennials, some are even underway. Kwangju is underway. Uh, uh, so, and the Dubai Art Fair will be underway. Many things will indeed be underway, but I'm not sure of the numbers. And uh, perhaps also we will all become reconciled to a certain hybrid uh, approach to these things. Some, th some of it physical, the rest online. But exhibitions, I think, are back for sure. Anshu, why are we only talking of the negatives of the pandemic? Why not the positives which happen maybe by default, but positives indeed? I've actually spent a fair amount of time talking precisely about the positives. Uh, the whole idea of showing all of these practices and what was achieved has to do with how the negative was in a kind of form of jujitsu. The energy of the negative was worked with and worked around. Alolika Datta asks, as you mentioned, when referring to Sudhir Patwardhan's morning tea, the painting appears to engage in a kind of dialogue with a painting by another artist. Is this something that artists tend to do? to try to communicate with other artists through their work? Has it happened during any other crisis? Well, this happens uh, all the time. It happens not only at moments of crisis where it might be heightened, but it is part of the everyday practice for many artists and many of the artists that I've shown here, for sure. Um, it's part and parcel of Atul Dodia's practice, for instance. Um, that sense of being part of a large garana, of transcontinental garana, even of artists, you know, from all places and periods. That's part, that's an integral, it's a cornerstone of his practice. For Sudhir Patwardhan, definitely. For Geef Patel, definitely. Uh, for, a, for a number of the artists whose work I've shown here, and many, many whose work I haven't shown here. It's, it's, it's part of the, what I characterize as the riyas or the sadhana of, uh, of, of being a visual artist. I'm not quite sure how to go. I hope that answers your question. Hello, Rika. How do I go down? Oh. Anonymous attendee, has there been a reversion to older and slower formats like the book for knowledge and engagement with the arts? Oh, absolutely. I have to say that there really has uh, the book in any form, whether it's Kindle or what you can order. The, uh, who was it who said recently, was in uh, a young relative, a young friend, someone who said, uh, you know, uh, a book, the thing with pages. So the thing with pages is, uh, is definitely back. Um, also, because as I've been reflecting so much on temporality, I think there's also been a need to simply get away from being bezoomed and being in front of a screen all the time, as many of us have to be. It's incredibly uh, consoling to the eyes to just look at printer's ink on paper. Uh, also, I'm a writer with a new book that's about to appear in print in March. So I'm at this point, as always, a great fan of the book. How has the COVID experience shaped the storytelling and experiential, even the recording aspect of art? Um, yet to be seen, I guess. I mean, I don't have an immediate answer for this, <clears throat> but I think that the test, the testamentary, is that really the right word? The bearing of witness, and if you will, the telling of, of certain kinds of stories, however elliptically or in condensed a manner, has certainly been but even of the practices that I've, I've presented here. What cultural shifts have you observed post COVID? Will cultural subject matter change? How? Not sure there's a simple or single answer to this. I think this is, uh, we're still very much within the pandemic moment. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll need a bit of distance and retrospection to, to consider that question. Disha Gandhi <coughs> asks, do you think in an artist's career it's important to depict pandemic? What if the artist's journey is different? Um, there's absolutely no mandate to depict pandemic or to depict anything else. I mean, it's up to the artist's journey. I mean, remember that the artists that I chose from previous centuries were artists who were responding to cataclysmic moments in their time which is not to say that that's all they ever did. Remember that Bosch also painted the Garden of Earthly Delights. That's um, full of very jolly proceedings. 
Gaurav Ogle asks, is the future of the arts workspace digital or will incorporate an essential element of the digital? I think that many of the, the advantages we've had through this kind of digital, digital communication will stay. Um, but I guess they'll, they'll be integrated into our normality like so many other things were. I mean, when I was 10 years old, the possibility of speaking to someone over what I think was called a photophone then was still science fiction. It's for many years now, then just, you won't even notice it. We have it. Similarly, everything that we've gone through in this year is probably just going to sediment itself into our normality. So we won't even notice that it was once so different, is my guess. In Sahaj Rahal's work, what do you think the flame-like figures indicate? I actually have dwelt uh, to a considerable degree on precisely some of those questions. I cited, for instance, what I take to be his citation of uh, certain Safavid figures with their flame auras. Also references to the Mio guardian figures in uh, Japanese Buddhist um, iconography. And Sahaj's method is really to leave the scope of interpretation wide open. So please feel free to respond from your own uh, stories and emphases. Do you think the museum or cultural institution has become less didactic and more a place for discourse or different lost that somehow? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. Is the museum or cultural institution less didactic and more a place for discourse of different ideologies? Has it become an incubating space or a lab? Yes, absolutely, of course. Uh, not because of the pandemic. That's, that's already a move within museum culture, which has been underway for at least a decade. But it's a, it's a place of contestation. I mean, I've, in, in another series of talks, I've characterized that as the move from the museum as a container to the, of objects to the museum as a platform for experiences. So the museum as forum is a trope that, uh, or a laboratory or an incubator. Yes, absolutely. Disha Gandhi, a second or third question. Who, according to you, is an art critic of repute for the genre of geometric abstraction in India? I would suggest that you read the available literature and form your own conclusions. Uh, what is the irreplaceable impact of the pandemic on the arts? Kinnari Saraya asks. And I should take this public occasion to apologize to Kinnari for another question she's asked me via email to which I haven't yet responded, but I will. Uh, I don't really know what the eventual effect of the pandemic is going to be. Uh, will we move on at some point and forget what we've gone through? Will some mechanisms, processes and reflexes become part of our new normality? Possibly. Uh, but I think it's too early to predict what might happen. After all, we've all gone through world wars and uh, all kinds of vast cataclysms. And I don't know that there's actually a memory of that, except as embodied in institutional shifts. Uh, thank you, Benita. Very good presentation. We miss noise as well. What is your take on that? God knows, I've been making a fair amount of noise for the last hour and 15 minutes. But uh, yeah, noise is all around us. I think we just need to sensitize ourselves to it. Uh, A. Kulkarni, the great shift from the exterior to the interiority of our being. Uh, certainly true in the kinds of studio contexts of reflection and articulation I've been thinking about. Tanishka's question about transmedia friendly mediums that will accommodate for singular experiences. Augmented reality, I think, is already well underway. I'm not quite sure how widely available it's going to be uh, and what its applicability might be. I tend to be a bit cautious about this, and I don't have a one-shot answer. As the pandemic made people question materialism, uh, I don't know. Cataclysms tend to make people question materialism and to go back to a deeper level of being. But when things settle down, we all realize that we all have a very strong materialist side to ourselves, and it's incredibly important. So this is always going to be a ratio between our materialist expressions and our uh, explorations of interiority. How do I learn more about art and local artists? I'm going to let Asad Lalji answer that, actually. Um, and 
other colleagues actually in the space of uh, what I'm going to call public reason and public knowledge. I think the great importance of, uh, this is not a commercial break for Avid. I genuinely have admiration for Avid, for Gyan Pravaha, for uh, what the CSMBS and the BDL museums do, what uh, G5A is doing, what a great many institutions that I'm only naming the Bombay ones. Uh, Delhi has had Koj, it has Koj, it has had uh, Sarai CSDS, um, all the work that the KNMA does by way of outreach. There actually is just so much going on, actually, if you would uh, reach out and uh, seek conversations. And there was a question about science museums. Will they have a new position in the cultural ecosystem? They should do. I mean, Bombay, where we are speaking from, although we assume that many people who've joined us are from elsewhere, uh, Bombay has a fine uh, science museum. It's not usually even noticed by people in the art world. You should notice it more, the Nehru Science Center. Uh, Bangalore has the Bengaluru Science Gallery, which is a uh, thriving and throbbing institution at the present. So yes, science museums should indeed have uh, a new position in the cultural ecosystem. Simple answer to that. We shouldn't even be making these distinctions between science institutions and arts institutions. I'm old fashioned enough to think that <clears throat> there should be no dichotomy between the arts and the sciences, so the humanities and the so-called hard sciences. Assad's return to the screen suggests that it is time for the vote of thanks. But before that, let me thank, thank you, you, Assad, and uh, our marvelous colleagues at Avid. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ranjit. I mean, you know, it's always such a pleasure listening to you. It's like listening to poetry. And, you know, I mean, needless to say, you are a poet. And hopefully in March, we'll be doing another, another of our collaborations. I can't even count the number of, of collaborations we have done. And, Honestly, as you, you rightly said in your introduction speech, you've been such an integral part of our journey at Avid. I mean, this is like a mutual admiration society. <laughs> to stop here. But, but, you know, I, what, what actually I also noticed and I was so thankful for when going through your presentation because you haven't sent it to us till now. And I, I noticed <laughs> that seven out of your 10 artists have, have been collaborators and supporters of Avid from, from Atul to Sudhir to Sahaj. Um, and give and and also in our in our in our new uh, avatar. I mean, from Jitish and 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 Samir, and obviously you you got Manjot in for our wonderful blurring uh, boundaries. Uh, um, I mean, I, I like to call it the Avid Labs because it was our first foray into this online residency, and we also did launch in in this lockdown the artists behind the art series but honestly i thank you thank you so much ranjit um, thank you to our audiences for tuning in you know we have many very exciting uh, programs lined up um, you know you just have to stalk us on social media or go to our website to check it out but next week we have a very interesting discussion um, the power of prose again writing and healing in the time of COVID with Siddharth Dhanmansangi and Nonita Karla. And Feb is another whole uh, plethora of programs. I'll let you check that out on your own on our website. But thank you for tuning in. Um, it's been such a wonderful uh, session, Ranjit. I won't, I won't uh, you know, give away the, 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 the magic of what we plan, we're plotting for March, but you know, uh, stay tuned and uh, look forward. And remember, you know, that with Avid, you know, stay tuned, stay safe. And remember that learning never stops. Thank you very much. Have a good night and have a good weekend. Thank Thanks. you so much.